on October 7th, the state ordered a halt to all worship services in Lincoln, Nebraska. First Plymouth closed its doors. One month later, the state lifted the ban and First Plymouth was able to begin worshiping in time for the holidays. That was 1918. In 2020, the pandemic just lingers on and the social distancing goes on for months and months. In 1528, the city that Martin Luther was living in fell to the plague, the bubonic plague, and many priests evacuated the city for the safety of the countryside, but Martin Luther stayed behind to minister to people. And it was during that pandemic, during those long days of the pandemic in 1528, that Martin Luther composed the great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Martin Luther, that professor of theology, Augustinian monk, Martin Luther, the man who nailed those 95 protestations and disputations on the Wittenberg door that launched the renewal movement that created two major divisions in Christianity between Roman Catholic and Protestantism, that Martin Luther was also a composer of hymns. We've now been singing a mighty fortress is our God for almost 500 years. That's an old song. It may be the oldest song that we continue to sing in some regular fashion. I mean, I sing some sort of old songs. I, I sing Here Comes the Sun every morning in the shower. That's probably too much information. But that's like over 50 years old. Here comes the sun, do 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 here comes the sun, and I say, what's McCartney say? He says, it's all right. It's a great way to start the day. I mean, I sing old songs. That's like 50 years old. We sing the Star-Spangled Banner. That's a couple hundred years old. But a mighty fortress is our God. Might be the oldest one we sing a lot. 500 years. This song, we sing it because there's something essential about it. It goes on and on, sung all around the world in different cultural contexts, in different languages, because it allows us to sing our faith in some way that is essential. That being said, I don't really like that hymn. I mean, I don't really like the style or the tonality or the lyrics. I don't like it but I love it. I'm in the sermon series called Timeless Hymns for a Time Such as This. And this week is A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and I still think it speaks to our time. I don't like the hymn, but I love it. And this will take me a while to explain. I've talked about 19... Well, I've talked about 2020 and 15... 28 and 1918. I want to talk about 1986. I was a university student in 1986. Do you remember 1986? Christianity was being expressed through tele-evangelists, and it was really cheesy, kind of a greedy, cheesy, tacky, overly literally form of Christianity. And so as a university student, I, I was Christian, but you didn't want to have anything to do with that type of religion that you were seeing on TV. And so I didn't go to church much as a university student. I mean, that's a typical storyline. People don't, in America for 200 years, don't go to church much in those years. During college, I went to church seven times. I remember it was two Christmas Eves with my family, an Easter, and, and then maybe four times on my own. But when I would go to church, it was to sing the hymns. I, I missed it. I remember one day, I walked down from the hill in Boulder. I lived up on the hill right by the sink, and I walked down, walked across Pearl Street Mall, and First Congregational Church is right by Pearl Street Mall. I walked into church, and I needed to sing some hymns. 
And the beginning hymn started, and it was, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and I was disappointed. I just don't really like singing that hymn. And as a college student, it was obvious to me why I didn't like the hymn. The the way it begins, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, a bulwark never failing. It's a martial, militaristic-sounding hymn. And to me, That's the opposite of what real Christianity is about. Anything overly stout or militaristic, Christianity is something gentle. Real Christianity is something so soft and humble. And this hymn doesn't seem to express that, so I I didn't like it. I don't like that, that militaristic approach. I like things more quiet and loving like, well, you know our faith. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Turn the other cheek. Why do you call me good? No, I'm not good. No one's good but God. The humility, the quietness, the gentleness. There's a story that I tell a lot about a minister friend of mine that had to preach her candidate sermon. That's when you stand in front of the congregation, you give a sermon, then they vote whether to hire you or not. It's a dramatic moment. It's a big moment, and it was a key moment in her life. She got up in the pulpit, started the sermon, and just as she began talking, her front cap flew out of her mouth. Her front tooth was a cap. It bounced around under the first pew in the sanctuary. So now she doesn't have a front tooth, and her whole sermon was about faith. You can't say the word faith without a front tooth, without a horrible lisp. And so immediately she had to come up with different words for faith. Her whole sermon, she had to riff on using different words like love or trust, peaceful. What was going to be a stout proclamation of faith became something very gentle, and it was the best sermon she ever gave. Yeah, I knew as a college student why I didn't like this hymn. It was just too stout, too militaristic. And, and then right away it goes into talking about the devil. Um, and this ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. The devil's craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. The devil? I, I don't believe in a literal devil. I, I it has incredible symbolic power about how evil is on the move in our world. But, but the devil, it's so medieval. This hymn goes medieval on you. Martin Luther was basically from the Middle Ages, right? I didn't like singing this hymn at all. But I was 22. And I was just learning how to read with a more discerning heart, to listen closer to what you read. And as I was singing the hymn that day, I began to hear something more beautiful. I could see beyond the words I didn't like to a sweeter melody, to a deeper meaning. As the hymn begins, right at the start, it says, our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing the flood of mortal ills prevailing. Right at the start of the hymn, it says life is hard. You see, this hymn is going to convey some basic truths we need to hear. The truths that life is hard, that all things are transient, everything we love most will pass. Everything is ephemeral. Life is hard. Everything is transient, but you have to find a way to live authentically. It will talk about one little word upon which everything depends, and it offers a basic fact. Oh, so hear with me this hymn. So first it starts with this flood of mortal ills prevailing. I need a hymn that starts right away reminding me life is difficult. If every hymn was sweet and sentimental, saccharine, put rose-colored glasses on? No, I need this truth. Life is difficult. That's the first noble truth of Buddhism. Life is suffering. It's a core truth of Christianity and the cross. Life is suffering. You know this, my friends. Life is hard. This hymn is true. And somehow in that, that reality of 
a hard life, we need to find our way together. Mortal ills prevailing. And then it goes on to say, did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. This is the second verse. Did we in our own strength confide? This hymn sounds like it was all about strength. I I thought this was all about showing you can force your way, but right away the hymn deconstructs itself. Do we in our own strength confide? No, our striving is losing. We clamp down so hard on life, but there has to be a way to live even amidst the difficulties that takes a looser grip. Our losing, our striving is losing. And then it goes on to say that our kindred and our goods will all go. Let kindred and goods go, this mortal life also. Life is transient. Everything you love and cherish will pass. This is not just sadness. This is truth. Life is fleeting. I have a screensaver on my computer. It's a picture of my four-year-old son, Bryce, when he was four, and he's holding a little chick. Now, if you're holding a chick, you have to hold it just tight enough to help it feel relaxed, but not so loose that it tries to squirm away. I have that screensaver because it reminds me that's how we have to hold life. In our strivings, in our attempt to force things through, we clamp down and we try to hold on to what we love, afraid that it will pass. We try to succeed, but you need to hold life a little more gently, all of life. Life is not a problem to be solved. Life is to be held more gently. Everything will pass. I was reminded of that this week at a burial. A 45-year-old had died in a car crash, and as the burial ended, his father was sitting by the grave, just crying by the grave. And I remember thinking that raising a child and all the the pain and sorrow and joy and love. I remember thinking, would you ever really choose that? Well, you see, let me tell you of something. In the early 20th century, the German existentialists, it was important to them to define the difference between choice and decision. This was critical. A choice is something you make weighing the pros and cons. A choice is something rational. You make your choices based on prevailing cultural assumptions and such, but a decision is beyond the rational mind. A decision is when you decide to do something that is the only way you could express who you really are. I think being a parent is a decision. If we tried to weigh all the pros and cons and the sadnesses that would come as I watched that father cry, I realized he had made a decision, one that makes life authentic, but oh, the pain it can bring. All things are transient. And then this hymn, then this hymn says there is one little word, oh, near the end, of which we will all depend, one little word shall fell all the evil in the world. What is that word? It's love. It's Christ. And then as this hymn has helped us face the reality of life, it reminds us of the one reality we must hold on to, the reality of God. It says, God's truth abideth still. God's kingdom is forever. Life is hard. All things are transient. We must find a way, we must decide to live anyway, but to know that there is that one word of love and there is God. My friends, there is God. May God bless you. Amen.